Steve Argus Falteroy Galer. I warmly welcome you all to this, the fifth instalment of my policy series. Previous episodes it touched on my policy work on renewable energy, the humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan, and trade opportunities for Irish businesses in Southeast Asia. We are fortunate to have an excellent lineup of speakers this lunchtime, and I am very excited to introduce the topic of today's discussion, carbon certification, a business model for carbon farming, question mark, which I hope you will enjoy. I am really very happy to be joined by Professor John Gilland, OBE, Chair of the EIP Agri-Operational Group Project, and Valerie Forlan, Policy Officer at European Commission in DG Climate. And of course, my colleague Colin Markley, MEP for Midlands Northwest. And also, we're very pleased that the President of the Irish Farmers Association, Tim Cullinan, will also be joining me shortly in the studio. This is a very distinguished panel, and I would like to thank each speaker for taking the time to join us in person and online. Before I hand over to our speakers, I would like to say a few words from my own perspective on the opportunities for Ireland in carbon farming. Climate change is a major threat to society and the economy and the environment. With negotiations around the proposed nature restoration law prominent in the media and public discourse, it is perhaps a good time to discuss the potential of carbon farming. Carbon farming, for those unfamiliar with the concept, is a holistic approach to agriculture that seeks to sequester carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and store it in our soils. By harnessing the power of nature, we can turn our farmlands into carbon sinks, reversing the harmful effects of greenhouse gas emissions and combating climate change. Carbon farming aims to reward farmers for reducing emissions and increasing carbon sequestration. Public and private carbon markets offer a promising opportunity to support the implementation of climate mitigation action on farms. <coughs> However, to reward farmers for the climate actions they take, a well-functioning carbon farming framework that provides confidence, verification and certification is essential. Many farmers in Ireland and Europe currently struggle to access carbon markets, as there are no approved tools for measuring, reporting and verifying emission reductions in farms. To overcome this obstacle, the European Commission has proposed the Carbon Removal Certification Framework. This proposal sets out a voluntary EU-wide framework to certify carbon removals generated in Europe. It sets out criteria to define high-quality carbon removals and the process to monitor, report and verify the authenticity of these removals. I've been working on this proposal on behalf of the EPP in the Parliament's Energy Committee, as says Colin Markey in the Agricultural Committee. However, as we're lucky enough to have Valerie from DG Clima on the panel, I am sure she will go into this proposal in more detail. The potential of carbon farming in Ireland at this point may not be realised. Our soils have a high capacity to store carbon, and by implementing regenerative farming practices such as cover cropping, rotational grazing, agroforestry, we can significantly enhance our carbon sequestration capabilities. This not only mitigates climate change, but also improves soil health, increases biodiversity, and strengthens the resilience of our farming communities. Furthermore, carbon farming presents an exciting economic opportunity for our agricultural sector. As the global demand for sustainable food products grows, we have the chance to position Ireland as a leader in carbon-neutral farming practices. We can create new markets for carbon credits, incentivizing farmers to adopt sustainable practices while generating additional income streams. By embracing carbon farming, we not only safeguard our environment, but also bolster the economic prosperity of our rural communities. <clears throat> the journey towards carbon farming will not be without its challenges. We must address concerns around land use, funding and market mechanisms. We need to ensure 
that farmers receive fair compensation for their contribution to carbon sequestration and that the benefits are equitably distributed. Collaboration between the agricultural sector and other stakeholders, such as the forest industry and environmental organisations, is crucial for developing comprehensive strategies and fostering innovation. To discuss the opportunities for Ireland in this area, as well as the main hurdles, I am delighted to hand the floor over to our distinguished speakers. Firstly, it is my pleasure to introduce our first guest, Professor John Gilliland. John has a very impressive CV. He is a willow and livestock farmer in Ireland, whose farm has independently been verified to be beyond net zero. He is also the Director of Global Agriculture and Sustainability at Devonish, Professor of Practice in Agriculture and Sustainability at Queen's University Belfast, and Chair of the innovative EIP Agri-funded farmer-led carbon farming project, ARC0. I am sure you'll agree he is fantastic to zoom in to speak on today's topic. So, over to you, Professor John Gilliland OBE, and thank you very much. So th thank you very much, and hopefully you can all hear me. Um, I <coughs> hope the team there are able to put up my first slide, please. Um, as, as that is coming, can I uh, th th thank you? Thank you very much, and hopefully everybody can see that. Um, I'm acutely aware that the you know the impetus for t t today is around the European Commission's proposal as such, but I want to take a slightly different view. Uh, first and foremost, regardless of the great CV that our chair has just read out, I'm a farmer first and foremost, and I I, I want to reflect over the next seven to ten minutes a practitioner's view in my role of over the last three years how I've chaired ARC0, this EIP Agri Operational Group, but taking a collection of farmers on a journey towards net zero. Next slide, please. And so when, when we sit as a group and we look at the challenges and it's really important that we actually look at the totality of this journey to net zero in, in its breadth. And although you know, we're talking about one particular uh, 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 um, proposal coming from the Commission on Carbon Removals, we can't take it in isolation from our issue about getting emissions down, looking at other public goods. So when we sit as farmers looking at this journey and you know, uh, trying to engage with, there are a collection of perceptions and barriers we see in this journey. The first one is the actual definition of net zero and how it is interpreted. The second one, everyone now is setting national targets, uh, yet it's really hard as a business to touch those national targets and understand what does it mean for my business? I don't actually know my numbers. What are my greenhouse gas emissions? What are my carbon stocks? What are the least cost options that I could look at my business? So how do I actually get help to know my own numbers? And when I go and do that baselining, can I also baseline my carbon stocks and not just my emissions? And can I do it in a way when I use these life cycle assessment calculators? But currently, they use things called factors or averaging. And those averaging, actually, if I, if I change my behavior, because I'm all lumped in with everybody else, I don't influence that and I don't get recognized for my change. And so can we move these factors from what they call tier one and tier two to tier three to improve accuracy so that accuracy can actually pick up the change that I do as a farmer and a land manager. And when I deliver that improvement, will that improvement be actually picked up by the Greenhouse Gas National Infantry? Will it be picked up by the scope three emission declarations that are out there? Because currently, a lot of them aren't. And when I look at my totality of my business and I look at the Greenhouse Gas National Infantry, my business as a dynamic business actually engages in four different vertical silos in the National Greenhouse Gas Infantry. So can I actually look at insects? And within that, can I also look at what other benefits this journey can deliver? Because I don't think society will allow us as farmers just to deliver one single uh, public good. 
you know, we've got things like producing healthy, nutritious food, but also improving water quality, improving biodiversity. And I think as a land manager, I have to look at how I deliver those multiple public goods. Next slide, please. So I always start this by actually giving a definition of net zero. And I think it's really because not everyone understands that. In our case, for our EIP operational group, we defined what we meant by net zero. It is where the sum of emissions equals the sum of segregation adjusted for any fossil fuel CO2 emissions we displace with, with renewables and any methane emissions we reduce by waste management within our farm. It is not about zero emissions. And sometimes the media don't necessarily get that. And it's really important that we articulate what is the definition of net zero. Next slide, please. One of the key parts of this, and this is very relevant to the Commission's proposal, is the place that we've got the biggest knowledge gap is actually not in emissions. It's about measuring carbon stocks in a landscape that farmers manage. And what has really been tremendous over the last five or six years is technologies have come forward. We in our EIP Agri Project Arc Zero have focused on two new technologies in the last five to eight years. We've been using aerial LIDAR surveys, so using laser scanners, scanning our landscape between 15 to 40 scans per square meter compared to a satellite at one scan per uh, 10 square meters. Um, the second area, uh, sorry, my slide has disappeared again. Maybe the slide can be put back up, please. Um, uh, the second area is now using precision soil sampling and analysis, not just to 30 centimetres, but down to one metre. Um, there are certainly now teams out there that can core soil uh, right down to the sea horizon or one metre deep and give us results in our soil organic carbon and bulk density and not to 15 centimetres, 15 to 30 centimetres, 30 to 60 centimetres and 60 centimetres beyond. So we can really interrogate what carbon is where in the soil, and what land management and what land use gives you the most carbon, what gives you the least carbon at a price point that um, was unrealistic five years ago. And this kind of technology and services now, the price has dropped as low as 20 euro uh, for the sampling and analysis. And it allows us now for the first time to do huge acreages of actual real sampling on farm, on individual farms. Next slide, please. And when you do this, this is a LIDAR image of my own farm. And what you're seeing, the different colours, are the heights and breadths of all my above ground biomass. So I've got deciduous woodland, I've got silver pasture, I've got, in my case, short rotation willow coppice, I've got grassland. And so you can see very accurately what have I got. And when I redo it every five years, I can measure change, whether it's additional change or not. But we can see that. And from this, we can dissect that. Next slide, please. And again, this is my carbon asset register for all my above ground biomass. And you can see the amount of kilometers I have in hedges. You can see my single trees, my deciduous woodland, my bioenergy. And you can see the conversion then in total carbon. Next slide, please. So we've done exactly the same using the soil carbon uh, tool I showed you in a moment ago. We've broken my own farm down into different land uses, different land managements, and we've worked out then the carbon in our soils. And you can see in my own farm, when you add both the trees and my soils together, and then convert it to carbon dioxide equipments. On my farm, I'm managing just under 24,500 tonnes of carbon dioxide equivalents of carbon stocks. That's not additional, that's carbon stocks. But now I've set my target. So when I redo this in five years' time, could I have 26,000 tonnes? And so I can clearly show the additionality. But the challenge out there is if I deliver 26,000 tonnes in five years' time, will that actually be recognised? Will the Greenhouse Gas National Infantry be sophisticated enough to actually capture that? 
Will scope three emission declarations be sophisticated enough to actually report on a net carbon basis, not on a gross carbon basis? And so this is some of the key concerns we have going forward in this journey. Next slide, please. So when we did that across then our Arc Zero farmers, and you can see uh, 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 the, uh, the, the six farmers named there, you can see the enterprises, you can see their gross emissions, you can see their gross segregation, and you can see their net emissions. And in my last column on the right hand side is the percentage reduction that their net position is against their gross emissions. And what you can see is all the farms are at different places on this journey. And it's really important we help empower farmers and land managers with their own data so that they know exactly where are they on this journey, where are they good, where are they not so good, where should they prioritize, where should they not prioritize. And remember, at the end of the day, the legislation of net zero is about getting the average of the industry to zero. It's not about getting every farm to zero. And it's about how we create a framework to allow farmers who are really good at this to get on with it. Farmers who are less good, well, if they if they can't go on the journey themselves, well, then maybe they might need to come to some arrangement with their neighbour who is good at it. But it's at least bringing measurement, reporting and verification with integrity. Next slide, please. And um, when when you do that, we also need to look at these models that we are using that we're encouraged to use, use these um, factors. Uh, and um, uh, for greenhouse gas emissions, um, these factors are nationally averaged at tier two. But alas, carbon sequestration, which is really important to the carbon removals proposal, is internationally averaged at tier one. And really, we need to invest in better knowledge generation to get all of these factors up to tier three so that individual farmers' behavioural change will be recognised. Because you want to find a way for the pioneers and early adopters, if they make the change and give leadership, they need to be recognised for it and not averaged down from by other farmers who don't want to go on this journey. Next slide, please. But there's a catch in this. And that catch is the current national reporting systems we have in every member state. This is just, I've taken a cut and paste out of the National Infantry for Ireland. And the reason I've put this up is dynamic farming businesses actually have activity in four totally different silos at the moment. They have it in energy, they have it in agriculture, forestry and land management, they have it in land use, land use change and forestry, and also if they have some waste processing facility, they also have something in waste. And the difficulty in how we report in the Greenhouse Gas National Inventory is there's no ability within a legal business to inset one against the other. And that really is shackling farmers and how they do their business around one silo without freeing them up to optimize what they can do in other silos. And so they can go into the toolbox and bring out the right tools for their business and get it recognized for the totality of their business. Next slide, please. So when you do that, when we go back and look at the Arc Zero farms, um, the extra column I've put in here is about when you add renewables in, and two of our farms have some renewables. My own personal business has a big renewable business. And when you add that in, I mean, I was just above, I was just beyond net zero anyway. But when you add in the renewable contribution that I have a big renewable heat business is I am way beyond net zero. And really our plea as practicing farmers is unshackle us and allow us to use all the tools in the toolbox to allow us to go on a net zero and not just focus on emissions alone. Next slide, please. So I want to finish off and say, you know, much that we've been focusing on carbon removals, our journey to net zero. When you use technology like, technologies like LIDAR and precision soil sampling analysis, you can also deliver other public goods at the same time. This image here is of a naked LIDAR image of one of my colleagues' farms, Simon Best of, uh, of Acton House Farms. This is Simon's runoff risk map. It is using the same LIDAR data we're using for measuring trees and hedges, 
but it's using it with a different piece of software. And when you then overlay the soil nutrient maps on it, you can work out the runoff risk about how in extreme rainfall, nutrient soil pesticides may leave our farmland and go into water courses. So if you want to improve water courses, actually using this technology to give you precise knowledge of where your runoff risk is, where your critical source areas, really allows us to accelerate our improvement in water, in water quality. But it's still part of the same measuring, reporting, and verification. For me, measuring, reporting, and verification, our experience is as expensive. But it is a public good. And my plea is the actual measuring, reporting, and verification, and the baselining, and the revisits of that as a public good, the public purse should actually pay for it. I'm not asking Nessie to pay for the behavioral change. But if we want integrity with one framework, with one system that concerned citizens can actually understand, we as farmers need help to get these baselines done, allow us to know our numbers, empower us so we make better quality decisions and we deliver for net zero, but we deliver other environmental goods as well as staying as food producers, producing good, nutritiously dense food for a healthy society. Thank you. John, thank you very much for that. I'm quite sure those watching online will be very impressed and will have a lot of thinking to do as a result of what you said. You can be somebody who is working on the ground, literally, every day on his own farm, and also an expert in the whole area, combining both the academic and the practical. And certainly, we really appreciate what you said. And I'm quite sure there'll be a lot of questions. Now, we'll move on to our next speaker. Before I do so, I just want to say I have been joined here in studio all the way from the premier county of Tipperary, uh, the president of the IFA, Tim Cullinan. And he will be speaking to us shortly. So. You are most welcome, Tim, and thanks for coming to Brussels. So now we will go to our next speaker, very important, especially as a follow-up to what John had to say, and that is uh, Valerie Forlan, Policy Officer at the European Commission in DG Climate. Valerie, thank you very much. in the beginning. Uh, yes, it's better if you unmute me. <laughs> thank you. So uh, you didn't, I, I was just thanking you and thanking you for having me. Um, and I just wanted to put on one slide to give a quick overview of our proposal, uh, the proposal from the European Commission for a framework to certify carbon removals. So we came with this proposal because we observed there was a gap. Um, there was a need for a, a unified, harmonized framework for carbon removal certification because now, nowadays, you see, nowadays you see there are many uh, actors in the carbon credits market, uh, many companies interested in, uh, in carbon removals because they're making uh, some uh, net, net uh, uh, neutrality claims, but also, of course, the public sector is interested in uh, paying for this type of public good because uh, now all EU member states have very ambitious targets uh, for, um, in, for uh, climate mitigation. Um, but there, are, there is no harmonized and reliable framework to certify these carbon removals. There are many different methodologies um, and it's, uh, it's difficult to judge of their quality. So we thought uh, it would be better to have a unified framework. Uh, so the, the first part, the first pillar of our proposal is a set of four quality criteria and the acronym uh, quality actually stands for what these four criteria are, which is a uh, quantification. We need a reliable quantification of the carbon removal. Of course, this is the most important, the basic thing, but also we need to assess the additionality of a project we need to assess um, the, the duration, uh, how, for how long this carbon is going to be stored, because uh, especially in the case of carbon farming, carbon storage is not necessarily permanent. And then, like also John said, uh, we need uh, to make sure that we are not only uh, delivering on climate, but also we at least should not harm other environmental objectives, such as uh, water quality or biodiversity, and if possible, even uh, 
contribute to these other environmental objectives. This is what we mean by sustainability. So we have these four quality criteria, uh, just to say they will not only apply to carbon farming, but also to other types of carbon removal, such as uh, industrial, uh, industrial technologies to, to, for instance, directly capture air from the, um, capture carbon from the air and store it underground. So these principles are very wide. They're supposed to apply to all types of carbon removals. And then, of course, uh, because they, they, they cannot, the four principles themselves they cannot be too specific, we need to come later with more specific methodologies that apply these criteria with detailed rules to each type of carbon removers, the carbon farming one and the, the permanent storage in geological formations, but also carbon storage in products. So what you see on the right of, this, of my slides is the idea that these quality criteria that were in the proposal will now in the next uh, two, three years uh, be translated into specific certification methodologies, uh, which we are already working on together with an expert group that comprises uh, all member states, but also all uh, important stakeholders. And we will actually have a meeting uh, of the expert group specifically on the topic of carbon farming, so methodologies for carbon farming uh, in only two or three weeks, on the 21st, 22nd of June. And this will be web streamed, so anyone can can um, can uh, listen to it. Uh, the the link will be available on the web page of this expert group, expert group on carbon removals. You should be able to find it quite easily. Then the second thing we wanted to this second problem we wanted to address is that all these uh, existing already carbon farming schemes and carbon certification schemes, not only do they have different methodologies, but they also use different certification processes. So some schemes are governed, uh, have better governance than others, and uh, they don't always use third party independent auditors. They use registries who have different uh, uh, templates and formats. So we also need to harmonize the certification process. And this is the second part of our proposal, rules for the certification process, which, just to simplify things, we really took over from um, the rules in the Renewable Energy Directive for the um, certification of a sustainable biomass, so that also um, people working in the, in the bioeconomy field, they already used to this type of rules. So in a nutshell, this, is, this was our proposal, and, the, and I hinted at why we came up with this proposal. We are now, of course, in co-legislation phase, so the Parliament is discussing its, um, its amendments, so the Council is discussing its amendments, and we hope for a swift um, progress on this file, because, of course, we have elections next year, and um, our goal, our wish is to finish the co-legislation procedure before uh, the next elections, of course. But we are having very, very good uh, exchanges with all the institutions, and we, we hope this will be the case. I'm very happy to answer any, any questions you might have. Mm. But that's for the, for the time being, I think this is enough because I see also we are running a bit behind schedule. Okay. Farry? Are you with us? And finished? Yeah. Thank you ever so much, and we will have a couple of questions for you shortly. Now I'm going to move across to uh, my colleague in the European Parliament, who is joining us online, Colin Markey. Colin, of course, is the former president of Mocklin and Ferma, and of course, more importantly, from the European Parliament's point of view, he sits on the Agricultural Committee, and he has been involved in lots of legislation here that affect farmers across the EU. So, Colin. You great, Augusta. Right, glad. Thank you, Sean, and thank you for inviting us along to be part of your webinar. I think it's very timely in that carbon farming is at the centre of, if you like, conversations at the moment, alongside, if you like, nature restoration law, which is equally, I suppose, a exercise in people's mind at the moment. I suppose one thing that interests me about the two is, I suppose, in a lot of ways, nature restoration law is dictating what should happen, whereas carbon farming is creating an opportunity to enable people, to allow them to empower the, the, the actors, be it the farmers or the landowners, to actually, as John has outlined already, to take actions, identify what makes sense, be rewarded for good actions, and through that, then, a, if you like, own their own journey in terms of how they 
perhaps achieve net zero, but also how they make a positive contribution towards a sequestering carbon and broader, let's say, a emissions or emission reduction the issues that are are there. I suppose the first thing I'd like to say is, uh, for, uh, as you said yourself in Gallia, I'm involved with the ag agri opinion in relation to this, so it's it's very uh, interesting to to hear, uh, if you like, or to, to to look at the different issues. And I think maybe I'll just focus on some of the key issues that that are that are pertinent to our discussions. The first, I suppose, is a uh, what are we actually counting? And I suppose everyone assumes carbon farming we're counting like the, a sequestering carbon, but. As was kind of alluded to by, by John earlier, there's a number of other aspects to this that are important too. Like there's carbon equivalents in, in nitrous oxide or in methane that, that potentially can be can be counted. Equally, uh, where you uh, achieve emissions reductions, that, that, that perhaps could be counted as well. And the third point then beyond that is where additional measures that farmers might take, for instance, putting solar panels on the roof or, or any sort of energy savings that they, they may in the, uh, they're additional to what they would do ordinarily, uh, they, they, they could be rewarded for them. So I think that first point of, of ensuring that, I suppose, all the opportunities that are there at farm level are included. And I think, you know, from my own perspective and the proposals that we put forward, we look to ensure that all of those opportunities were included. I suppose the second point I talk about is the uh, monitoring, reporting, and verification. I, this, I suppose, is a, a couple of aspects to this. One is I think that we have to recognise the more effective we are monitoring, reporting, and verification is, the more we can then stand over the credibility of our carbon credits, and then the work more out there in the market. So I think to achieve the the, the top level of monitoring, reporting, and verification. It has to be the aspiration here and how that can be done. I think it's interesting to look at the, the Commission's proposal because the Commission's proposal is not about trading carbon credits. It's about creating a certification scheme that, that certifies what the carbon credits are. And therefore, then, our carbon, carbon in, in, in the context of carbon farming, uh, are. And then, they, they, it's, it, then they're, they're traded on the market no different than, than any other. And perhaps uh, the Commission will enable that market or not, that remains to be seen. But the, full, the most important thing is that those carbon credits are verified. And I think that, that, that that's so important. And um, the previous speaker talk, talked about the methodologies. And I think the methodologies are very important because I know from John's perspective, um, baselining, for instance, is is a key. We have, to, we have to establish where we start from. And then how do you record where the improvement is. And in my mind, there's two ways that this is done. I think that the Commission proposal reflects this in, in the scope. I think in fairness to the Commission proposal, it's broad in a number of areas, so it allows for different situations. But the idea of, of establishing an initial baseline and then perhaps coming back five years later and, and measuring, actually physically measuring the, the improvements at carbon, as long as you can do that effectively. I know uh, John has talked about soil cores and about LIDAR, and these are two technologies that are available that may help through that. But I think one of the things we looked at within the, is that any new technologies that come would allow us to establish that baseline would be taken into account. The other thing I think is very important, that we allow actions as well, that actions that farmers take, uh, that they get rewarded for them. It may be that you're not able to verify the carbon as effectively in the actions as you are in the baselining. But I think it's important that, uh, that actions that demonstrate that carbon will be locked into the soil for a long, long number of years because of those actions, then they, are, they should be rewarded as well. There's the possibility that they might be worth slightly less because, number one, you can't um, actually, to the same degree, you're relying on, on let's say, indicative figures that, that science has proven of the effect of them, but also uh, you don't literally have numbers that, that relate to your farm. So I think if someone could do the baselining scenario, as John suggests, it's probably a great opportunity. But I think we should be rewarded for actions as well as, as, as for, if you like, uh, actual carbon amounts on the ground. The, the second area I'd like to cover is who actually gets, who do you, do you sell your carbon credits to if you were to establish carbon credits through carbon farming? I suppose this is a very interesting question because for some that's about selling it within 
the uh, the food the food system, if you like, the food supply chain. Which, in other words, use the carbon credits from a farm. To, number one, make the farm carbon neutral. Number two, make the the food food processing sector carbon neutral, so that ultimately the sector as a whole could create itself as being carbon neutral. Or potentially, the alternative to that is to send them into other uh, sectors or, or other silos, as John called them, who other areas such as transport or different areas or, in, or industry where they have to offset. I would say hard to abate carbon. It can't be just any carbon, but if they, they can't achieve it, it's hard to abate carbon. And that's one of the areas that perhaps is, is somewhat more controversial in that some people want to just reward farmers within the sector. But I think if we want to get a true value towards our carbon credits, then we have to ensure that we get a real market market testing of the true value of them. And if we don't go out into a into a market uh, that, that that allows you to get the full value of them, then we won't get we won't bring the the amount of money into agriculture. And I think it's worth saying to, to not to lose sight of this is the opportunity to bring new money into agriculture. It's the opportunity that that money doesn't necessarily have to be public money. It can be private money where some will pay to offset their own responsibilities and ask agriculture to do that in return. I suppose there's a couple of other areas that I'd like to touch on. One, I think John touched on in relation to the, the he talked about the national silos. Well, there's a scenario too, if you like, the, the Lulu CF side of it, where the national inventories may be in competition with the individual, where, if you like, where an individual's car, like if you, if one of the things is, you can't double count and you have to have additionality in order to have legitimacy around your carbon credits. So in the area of double counting, to ensure that if an individual takes individual actions, that they are rewarded for them as the individual, as opposed to for the um, for for uh, that they go towards state inventories. And I think that's that's an area we have to watch closely because if, if uh, the actions of farmers are used to meet state uh, requirements, then that would negate the possibility of those farmers getting the benefit of them themselves because of the additionality clauses. So they'd be some of the key areas that I think are important. The other one perhaps um, that I'd just like to, to touch on as well is the idea of who actually would get rewarded for a carbon credit. Because uh, if you look at certain things, for instance, the, the forestry sector at the moment, where there's a big controversy in Ireland, where a, a, let's say a pension fund came came in from outside of Ireland and invested significant is proposing to invest significantly in forestry. I think we have to be careful to make sure that carbon credits remain with the landowner or the land manager, that a, the value of that credit is returned to the person on the ground, and it's not to let's say the consultants that may be working on it, but also to external investors who could see an opportunity here of investing in land just to access the carbon credits. And that you have to be seen to be a bona fide farmer in order to be able to activate some of those carbon credits. Just to pick up on a couple of points that John said just before I finish up, uh, he talked about the silos in the national inventory and to be able to access the, the well, essentially the four that are relevant to agriculture. And I would just like to point out that as part of amendments that we've put forward to the Commission proposal is to, to recognise that. And also the idea of the additional actions in relation to the likes of, let's say, additional measures that farmers can take, that they would be recognised and rewarded as well. They, that's another key area that, that, that we, we put across a large number of amendments, but I thought they were just a couple that, that would be worth highlighting. Uh, and then obviously that point about the landowner and ensuring it remains in the control of the landowner. But finally, I'd just like to say in terms of, I think this debate is going to boil down in a lot of ways to number one, to verify the, the, the how do we, how important it is to verify. And to me, it's very important to verify because that gives you the true value. And secondly, how you can, if you access the, the, the reward for this, because I think we have to make it open to a market that enables them to, to generate a true value. If you look at the value of carbon at the moment, it's only getting more expensive. So the reality is if you can access that true carbon market with a, a, a robustly verified carbon credit from carbon farming, I think that's where the verification is so important. If we can get our verification right, then we can command a, a really significant figure 
for, for these carbon credits. Uh, and that's where I'd be very interested in looking at this methodology that the Commission are going forward with in terms of what the proposals will be. Because I think I would ask that that, me flex that methodology would be flexible enough to allow for multiple different ways of, of uh, achieving the, the opportunity that is here. Because farmers can do so much in terms of uh, sequestering carbon and also in terms of other enhanced carbon credits, all to do it, whether it be other, other types of gas, gaseous emissions or reductions uh, or sequestering, or whether it be the water quality or biodiversity issues. When you look in the context of the debate we're having this moment about biodiversity, this is an opportunity to put farmers at the centre of the debate, give, empower them with the tools and reward them accordingly for addressing issues which, like no other sector, has the capacity to sequester carbon as the land-based sector does, other than, let's say, an industrial process. But the land-based sector offers the greatest opportunity to sequester carbon out there. And we have to enable the actors to be able to take advantage of that opportunity. And in terms of proposals we've put forward in relation to the current uh, Parliament or uh, Council Commission is to ensure that the scope is broad enough, that the verification is appropriate to get true value, and hopefully then the methodologies will come around how how we can measure and re uh, record and, and verify. And I suppose that's just an opening. Happy to take questions and uh, happy to hear people's perspectives as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Colum. A very comprehensive overview. And I'm quite sure many of the points you mentioned, Tim will have noted them. And uh, we will see now uh, what uh, Tim, as president of the IFA, has to say on all of this. Because, uh, as you pointed out, Colm, there has been, I think, uh, too much negativity in relation to agriculture in the public discourse and not enough positivity and giving credit for what they have achieved and, indeed, as you said, can achieve with the proper regulatory framework into the future. So, Tim, again, thanks for coming from Tipperary to Brussels. Yeah. Over to you. Yeah, thanks very much, Sean, and look, delighted to be here with you today. And uh, look, we're on a journey here, and you know, we've been dealing with climate change and reducing emissions up to now. And I suppose I think what's very important here is that we keep centre stage in all of this. It's absolutely, as farmers, you know, we have responsibility of reducing emissions and uh, getting to a point where hopefully we become almost carbon neutral. But I think you know, we want to be very conscious as well of food security and continuing to produce top quality food as we do both here in Europe and at home in Ireland as well. So I just want to make that point starting off. I think, Colm, you made a, an excellent point there that uh, you know, farmers need to be centre now in the debate on this. Uh, heretofore, you know, we've seen what has happened around nature restoration law, where this is you could say, being almost enforced on farmers without proper consultation. And I think it's critically important now, even at this juncture, we've seen this in the recent CAP, that now farmers are engaged with, with the Commission. And you know what I mean? That we, we work together on this, because this is very, very important for us. And I suppose looking at uh, where we are at the moment, and you know, a lot has been said already around the measurement, but I think this is critically important, you know, how carbon has been measured. And I think you know, we need a, a common standard right across the EU. I suppose what's worrying for me, recently I met with my Australian counterpart who was over in Ireland and uh, in, in, in Australia they claim that they will be um, carbon neutral by 2030. Obviously there's a lot more land available in Australia but this is, this is a question for the Commission. If uh, what the Australians are saying to me is they can offset carbon being sequestered into the soils and into the hedgerows against the emissions from bovines, and I think you know we need a decision around that, Sean. That's my my first point. Obviously, if we're going to offset, the second point is around CBAM, and this is the carbon um, mechanism where goods coming in to be used in agriculture, there's a tax on fertiliser coming in, there's a tax on steel and cement and all of the goods that's used for producing food. But there's no tax on food coming in from third countries, even if there's a, a lower standard. And uh, the point I want to make here is, so this reverts back to the point of carbon leakage, where we are here in Europe, we're here in Ireland, and we're producing top quality food. And you know we have 
the lands to do that and you know we have to be very careful around uh, carbon leakage. Uh, the next point and uh, it has been discussed already obviously <coughs> is funding and um, I suppose what, you know, what we're hearing a lot of in recent times again is the, the, the <coughs> MFF and the funding and you know, the funding around CAP and we have to be very careful that uh, we won't have the Commission proposal to use CAP money to around uh, climate initiatives. We've already seen a huge divergence in the CAP money for rewarding farmers producing cheap food to support European citizens to uh, environmental measures. That already is, is taking place. And uh, another, uh, the f next point I'd like to make is around, and already it has been raised, but I want to raise it again, is around carbon that's actually stored on farms already. So what, how is that going to be dealt with? Is, is farmers going to be rewarded for what's, what carbon is actually stored on farms? And I suppose there's a huge debate as well currently around soil types, and this comes back again to the nature restoration law. And um, our soils actually releasing carbon or sequestering carbon and uh, you know a lot of trial work is being currently done and in Ireland we are measuring at the moment and uh, the, the initial results that we are hearing is in particular mineral soils. Mineral soils are sequestering uh, a substantial amount of carbon and there's a huge debate around organic soils currently and the initial results now are stating that those soils are emitting less carbon as well and uh, I think this is very important and uh, another area is you know, the use of lands and uh, I know John would have done a lot of work on this particularly around multi-species grasses you know, where those grasses are used you can do two things you can continue, continue to use this land for grazing animals but at the same time sequest carbon into the soil and um, we have to look at as well the private sector coming in and buying up land. This is a huge concern for farmers and this goes back to my first point on food security. You know, we need to be very careful here that we don't end up in a scenario where private industry is coming in and I would call this greenwashing, buying up land, sequest carbon and continue doing what they're doing. And uh, my final point is around scope one, two and three, so where industry are striving to become carbon neutral but it's very important here if we look at the, the industry is scope one but primary producers are scope three and you know you have to bring everybody on the journey here and the fact that if primary producers are going to achieve, achieve um, a massive carbon reduction well then they have to be re rewarded for that and you know currently we're seeing food uh, price inflation but a lot more costs have been put on farmers dealing with climate you know the measures that farmers have taken on right across Europe currently and I have to ask the question again who's going to pay for this if you have a divergence of CAP money from producing food you know is the consumer is the consumer willing to pay more for the for carbon neutral food and uh, obviously the the state inventory and, and column you mentioned this point as well this is very very important you know who is going to own the credits who is going to be rewarded in particular you're right around you know the forestry scenario and you know we see what's happening with that currently in ireland and you know these are the questions that we need answered and i suppose look finally to say i think this is a time now for collaboration you know, with yourselves here in the parliament sean and with the commission and with farmers thank you very much I'd be pleased to see your emphasis on some of the issues that farmers have difficulty, I think, sometimes in getting the issues across where it matters. You mentioned there in relation to CBAM and funding and greenwashing. All those things need to be, I think, uh, definitely discussed and articulated and come to conclusions on them. Now, we haven't that much time left. I was going to ask uh, Tim one or two questions, but I'll leave that for the moment. I'll go back to John first. And John, I was going to ask you a question too, but I'm not going to ask you any question because of your expertise. I would just actually give you the opportunity, having listened to the other speakers, Valerie, Col uh, Valerie Collum and Tim, how would you respond to some of the points maybe that they made and what advice, because you're obviously very knowledgeable, would you have for us, particularly maybe Colm and I as legislators, and also in the broader sense of how we can actually progress this and ensure, as you said, that we improve everything, both in terms of carbon sequestration, biodiversity, the environment, food security, etc. Okay, John. 
So, so, so two things I want to labor, one out of what Tim has said, one out of what Colin has said. Um, Tim has labored the fact that actually, as farmers, we deliver multiple public goods. And it isn't just about greenhouse gas emission reduction. It's also about building carbon stocks and other issues. And that has to be sorted out. Um, I, I, I think the industry is wrongly maligned because uh, current policy drive is just on emissions. Yet the legislation for 2050 is net zero. It's not gross zero. And we really do need to get this across. The second thing which, which Colin flagged up is if we don't have a single measuring, reporting and verification standard with integrity, how will farmers ever get a proper reward for their behavioural change? And um, it, it, it's really important. So as a farmer and as, as a leader of, of a, a group of active farmers trying to face their responsibility, it's really frustrating that currently and um, Tim mentioned about the work of multi-species wards that we did in the lands of Douth and County Meath. Um, what, what, what we proved there is that we could drive production, deliver sustainable intensification through regenerative agriculture and reduce our footprint at the same time. And everyone said that was impossible. But we five PhD students funded by the Marie Curie organisation within DG Research. Uh, with credible universities of University College Dublin and Wagram University Research, clearly shown that if we can embrace this, but get the measuring, reporting and verification correct, we can deliver more nutritious food in a way that reduces emissions, builds carbon stocks, increases biodiversity and improves water quality. Why do people want to fight against that? I think that is a win for all multiple goods. And if farmers are empowered with really good information about their own farm, and it does worry me that at the moment we are not uh, being helped in actually working out our baselines. Where are we on this journey? How much carbon do I actually have? What am I asked to look after? And actually then once I get that, then setting my own targets. And if you're going to go on this journey, we need a credible way. If we've achieved positive behavior, can we have it recognized? And you can only do that if you put baselines in and you repeat those baselines in a, in a regular basis. I suspect that that will be absolutely core for the work in, 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 in DG Klima through the, you know, the carbon removals is how do we measure, report and verify to a level that has integrity so that the, the carbon that we actually sequester then has a value. My own personal preference, and I, I differ maybe from some of the panelists, you know, the monkey is on the back of food producers at the moment. We are the, being seen as the pariah. So for me, I, I, my first preference is can we get our own sector's house in order and get that pariah off our head before we sell our soul to some other sector in the economy and then find we actually need our carbon ourselves. And that's why you need the transparency and the, and the, and the baselines. Uh, I would hate to see airlines or whatever running away with all our carbon and then find we're continuously beaten up and we actually have to go back into the market and buy expensive carbon back again. That would be an own goal. Thank you very much, John. That's obviously a very, very valid point. I think and everybody would agree with you, but you're right. There are always dangers out there. And actually, that will bring me to the question to Valerie. Valerie, will the carbon removal certification be enough to develop robust carbon credit markets and ensure fair compensation for farmers' contributions? And then if you want to also <coughs> maybe respond to Tim's point about CBAM, tax and food coming into the European Union and of course the perennial question of funding. Valerie, thank you very much. Yes, um, so like um, MEP Marquis rightly said, this uh, step from uh, in our proposal, it's really a first step for the monitoring, reporting and verification of carbon removals. There are no rules in our proposal about how the removal units will be used. Um, so there is no rule about who can buy them, what can be done with them. Not because this is not important, but because we think uh, it's a stepwise approach and first of all, we need to get the quantification right. So I, I cannot tell you, yes, 
our proposal is going to fix the carbon credit market. It is going to contribute to more transparent and more reliable uh, carbon credit markets, which in turn may increase trust in this type of, um, of business, which is good for the farmers. What, um, where you can find rules or up, upcoming rules on um, how companies can make climate neutrality claims. So this goes in a bit in the direction of uh, what can be said, what can be done with these credits. There will rather be uh, the recent proposal on the for a green claims directive, uh, which says there will be coming upcoming delegated acts on a specific type of green claims, for instance, climate neutrality claims. So this is another initiative, a bit in parallel, unfortunately. So it's a bit a bit of moving target what will be in that one as in ours because uh, these are both proposals in the co-legislation process but uh, we felt if we now say you can use the eu certificates only for this and this purpose and not for that and that purpose we will be constraining our own uh, product if you want but many other products will be around that other companies could use because our our framework is, framework is just voluntary so we would a bit we would be a bit uh, uh, undermining our goal, which is to make high quality credits the norm. So it is on the side of the demand for carbon credits that you need to make these, these rules and not on the side of the supply, which is what we cover. Uh, but it's a very important debate nevertheless, of course. Um, then other points I, I heard, um, okay, from um, uh, from Tim, um, I think he question, the question for me was, is it if this uh, framework something that you can that a farmer can use to offset bovine emissions like they want to do they they heard from australia and uh, so it also relates to what mep Marke said about uh, the um the scope of carbon farming which for us it's only the removal part or uh re reducing the risk of uh, carbon it is not about uh, for instance bovine emissions um of course reducing uh, emissions from livestock from fertilizer it's also very important uh these agricultural emissions are, have a big share of the total eu emissions and as other sectors decarbonize in the future the share of agricultural emission over total emissions will only increase um if if nothing is, is done for agriculture so decreasing these emissions is very important it is not in the scope of this proposal which is about carbon removal doesn't mean that these activities should not be rewarded somehow. This can be done with, uh, with the CAP support. Uh, this can be done with other uh, certification frameworks, just not with ours. What I want to point out is also that uh, just a small advertisement that next week we are holding a, a workshop on the um, assessing ways to apply the polluter pays principle to agricultural emissions, uh, because this is an area where we were asked to to do a study by the Court of Auditors, by the European Court of Auditors. So, um, yeah, I think the, we, the, we will have some social media about it uh, tomorrow, the day after. So if you follow the DigiClima social media, you will see the link to register. Just a piece of advertisement. And then uh, the last one uh, that I wanted to touch upon was baseline. Was said, of course, this is a very important concept. Uh, now, um, I, I, I should say that uh, the way we proposed the baseline is a bit different from what I've heard. So a, a baseline set as uh, in uh, the initial state of affair, state of play in a farm at the beginning of the project. What we propose is the baseline should rather be the standard practice of other farmers in similar circumstances. So instead of looking at what is a carbon stock in my field at the beginning of the project, I will look at what is average carbon stock in other fields in similar circumstances, uh, namely similar type of soil, similar climate, similar region, uh, which will be fairer to those who already started in the past to, uh, to do good practices. So if you are already above this, if you're already doing better than your peers, this should be recognized. But of course, creating this, this baselines would require a lot of data, and this data should be integrated in geographic systems, which are able to look at different uh, uh, variables and different data sources from sampling, from modeling, from uh, remote sensing. And um, it, requir it would require some work. But I do believe this work will only will also improve 
the, our understanding of land practices in a country which will improve the inventories. I think it was a very good point that was made by, by Professor Gilliland about how do we make sure that the inventories pick up action by the individual farmers. Our, yeah, our vision is that in a few years we will have plenty of data. We already have plenty of data. We need to put them together and this data will become cheaper and cheaper because we see very, very fast innovation in this area. Um, and, and one day, one day, LULUCF inventories will be a sum of all the carbon farming activities on the ground. And well, it's, it's a vision, but uh, well, we, we are discussing it with our experts and we hope we get there. Thank you very much, Valerie. It's always good to have the Commission present and we appreciate you joining us today. So now, Colm, just a quick question for you, Colm, uh, following on, I suppose, in some respects what Valerie said. Beyond the carbon certification scheme, do you think there are other policies we should look at introducing to encourage and incentivize sustainable practices at uh, Parliament level and European level? One area I think we certainly need to look at is the whole area of EIPs, environment, uh, European Innovation Projects, uh, our partnerships, sorry. Um, they, they are an area, and I've seen a number of them in recent times that I've studied closely, and there's the potential to look and develop research and develop price practices through the use of these EIPs, where farmers uh, work, uh, come together as a group maybe, and look at a particular measures or actions they can take and how they affect what the outcomes are by, by, by working that through over a number of years. I think that's one particular area I think we should be looking at and to take more advantage of and it would help develop our understanding and knowledge of the whole area. I think the other thing as regards other, other legislation or other regulatory, environmental regulatory uh, actions that are ongoing I suppose, I think the point I would make about all of them is that it is to take take a leaf from the carbon farming mentality in that look at a way where you can work with the actor rather than dictate to the actor because I always believe when you have the person on the ground who's who's responsible for uh, if you if you if you empower them then your your results will be much greater. Just a couple of quick points I wouldn't mind picking up on if possible. Uh, just one that that Valerie mentioned around them. Um, the uh, the recognising baselines and people who have already uh, established um, uh, like good practice. The reality is, if we just solely look at the baseline, then we actually uh, reward people from a low baseline lifting that. But someone who already has good practice and someone who already is an early mover, like John, for instance, um, they they would not get recognised. So the system has to provide and allow for people who have already start start. Is, Begun, begun the journey. Also, another point that Valerie mentioned about our, our uh, webinar or event next week about a uh, uh, polluter pays. I'd ask the question in relation to that: Who is the polluter? Is the polluter the consumer of food or the producer of food? Because I think it's an area we need to be very careful about. And finally, just in relation to the idea of, um, I think it's important that all the opportunities are there. I appreciate that the first step is carbon and the certification of carbon removals. But I think carbon removal equivalents and the other actions that farmers can take should be taken into account. And uh, just a point that, that, that Tim had made about the mineral soils and the organic soils. There's no doubt the organic soils do emit carbon, but surely it's about rewarding people for redu reducing the ongoing emission of carbon from the, from the, the uh, organic soils and the actions to do that. So if you the, the bay, I think uh, while while Tim has indicated the figures are reducing, the, currently the suggestion is that a, a twenty ton of carbon is emitted from from uh, raised peatlands. I think the research is suggesting that that could be as low as twelve ton, but that's happening anyway. So surely we could reward people to stop that happening, and that I suppose is the whole rewetting debate, and that's the fa factors into our nature restoration law. But the bottom line here is. Surely we work a carrot system rather than a stick system. And that's where carbon farming could have a real positive part to play in, in, our, in our nature restoration challenges. And that's where I suppose I would have a concern that the current nature restoration proposals don't take that into account. Thank you very much, Colm. And now finally, Tim, if you want to say a few points, maybe in relation to the need probably for 
awareness campaigns so farmers are aware of what's happening, what's likely to happen, the opportunities that might be there. And also, you might just uh, elaborate uh, slightly on a point you made, which I have heard in recent times, the whole question of competition for land and how you would like to see maybe that uh, monitored and regulated far into the future. I think th that's a very key point because if farmers don't have land, they can't work. Yeah. Okay, Tim. Thank you, thank you, uh, John, uh, or, or Sean, and, and we'll start with the land one. And we know, I think, uh, land always becomes very emotive. And I suppose, look, uh, we have done an analysis of this in our own organisation, and um, so we have seen with all the current measures that's uh, at play here currently, it has the, the possibility of reducing the amount of land available for farming and for grassland farming of anything in Ireland up to about approximately 10%. So this is a huge challenge for us, Sean. And I suppose the point I was making earlier is we need to be very careful that we haven't private sector coming in and buying up land you know, for reducing their own emissions. I think it's very important in countries in Europe here and in countries like Ireland that don't have top quality land for producing food that land needs to continue in food production. I think that's very important. But I think I want to go back to uh, the point that John made. I raised it earlier, and John came back in and reinforced it again. Was do you know what I mean? Like the policy drive is only currently on emissions, and we need to look at this in the round. We need to look at the carbon, what we're sequestering into into soils and hedgerows, along with the emissions from bovines. This is very important. And I suppose, look, overall, we're on a journey here. And what is the journey we're on? The journey is about reducing uh, the temperature of, of the world, you know, the, the, the cooling down of yeah, the atmosphere. Yeah. This is what we're trying to do. And I think the combination of working with the two together is we need to start looking at temperatures. Instead of having you know, this whole debate, we need less cows, less cows, we can, do you know what I mean? And the other area is, you know, and we didn't mention it today, I know we were on carbon, but I think it's worth mentioning here as well, Sean, is, you know, how... The, the, the emissions are being accounted for, and in, in, you know, that is still a debate that's out there. I think we need to reopen that debate as well and couple that with now with what we're doing with carbon. I think uh, instead of um, farmers being uh, vilified here, like farmers are key in all of this, and I, I would say the opposite here. I think farmers have done, European and Irish farmers have done a substantial amount of work on reducing emissions already. So in Ireland, we signed up to a 25% reduction in emissions last year. We're working on that. Farmers have adopted several measures on their farms, and those emissions are reducing currently. And uh, I think we're on that journey. And I think producing low-carbon food is what we're about. And that's why now we're at this juncture now with carbon farming. I think it's very important for ourselves, yourselves as MEPs, as I said earlier, and the Commission, that we work jointly on this mm -hmm. and come up with a proposal that is going to work for everybody. Yeah, and I think on that note, I think we can leave because we've gone over time, and that's really the challenge. We've come up with a proposal that works for everybody and includes everybody in the discussions. And I think it's quite clear that, uh, as Tim said, the farming community, uh, I think legislators overall, the Commission, we all want to ensure that we play our part in uh, the Fit for 55 reducing emissions to net zero. And I think we can see there are some great practices, as John pointed out, in many farms around the country. And all that needs to be recognised and used to bring more on board without actually uh, disincentivising them. And of course, the whole question of uh, compensation and funding is something we have to look at as well. But I think this is a good start. Uh, carbon farming obviously has a lot of potential. Certification is going to be vital and we'll continue to work on it. So to all of you, thank you very much. If you have further questions, you can send them in to us and we can forward them to whoever you want them addressed to, be it John or Valerie or Colm or Tim, and we look forward to cooperating. As Tim says, it's all about cooperation. So let's do it. Thank you, Sean. Yes.